Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I hope everyone has had a wonderful day thus far for the MDE Diversity and Literature Symposium. So give me a thumbs up if you've had a great day so far. Or you can cheer, we can do either, yes. My name is Kim St. Martin. I'm the director for Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center. It's a gift to be with you today. And I have the gift of introducing you to our state superintendent, whose vision really has been to create this literacy symposium. Um, Dr. Michael Rice has been an advocate for championing literacy in the state of Michigan, and it's been his vision to really have MDE's Diversity in Literature Symposium and focusing on the how and why of literacy. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Rice. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. That was pretty good. That was, that was less middle school than I was anticipating. Good afternoon, everyone. There you go. It's a pleasure to be here with you at this literacy symposium. I want to thank the conference organizers, including but not limited to Drs. Delsa Chapman, Corinne Edwards, Renee Garcia, Jennifer Saylor, and the entire MDE literacy team, Denisha Rawls-Smith, Katie Dennis, Sandy Youngert, Melissa Manko, Rebecca Young, Missy Finnegan, as well as Dr. Kimberly St. Martin and the MTSS technical assistance team for their leadership. Give it up for them, please. <laughs> Gentle people, I also want to thank you for your energy, excitement, enthusiasm for what we're trying to accomplish in Michigan. You are driving this in your districts for 1.4 million public school children in 3,400 schools across the state of Michigan. You are the vanguard for a changed way of approaching literature. So gentle people, this little guy, I know, right? That's a leisure suit. This little guy with the freckles was a reader as a young person. In fact, he read most anything he could find. His mother took him to the library regularly, one summer, six days a week, in an effort, vain, to slow him down and to teach him up. This little fellow who bore a noteworthy resemblance to Alfred E. Newman <laughs> in Mad Magazine. If you don't understand, ask one of your older colleagues what that means. <laughs> used to play until dark and read until light. As much as he read, however, as much as he thought he read widely, and he did in certain ways in different languages, and as much as he thought he had had a strong education, and he did in certain ways, he most assuredly did not read diversely. For the classical canon to which he'd been exposed in high school, and in college, was diverse only within a Eurocentric literary tradition. This little guy didn't begin to read diversely, substantially diversely, until he became this not so much bigger guy <laughs> after college. I know because it was my journey. Two days after I graduated from college, I took the train from Connecticut to Washington, D.C. I soon began to help create a speech and debate program at a Washington, D.C. high school and then at other Washington, D.C. high schools. Shortly thereafter, I realized that one of the great African-American poets, one of the great poets in history, was born and lived most of his life in my hometown where there was a high school, among many others, named after him. But I didn't know, and in the words of Randall Robinson, the founder of TransAfrica, I needed to know, I should have known, as a function of my formal education. 
So I began my diversity and literacy journey, first with the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and soon thereafter with the poetry, short stories, essays, novels, and other genres of Langston Hughes, Alice Walker, Margaret Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks, James Baldwin, Vicky Giovanni, Audre Lorde, Ralph Ellison, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Maya Angelou, Ntozake Shange, and many, many others. This journey is now four decades old. I'm not. <laughs> but the journey is, and going strong. In those early years, I read and built my diverse classroom library as I geeked out and geeked kids on diverse classroom literature. Long before I had heard of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop's mirrors, windows, and sliding doors, I could see the power of diverse literature in my kids' engagement, interest, and excitement. Inspired by diverse literature, my students competed strongly in a 56-team metropolitan speech and debate league, the only urban public high school in an, a league otherwise of suburban, private, and parochial schools. You can lament the past, educators, but you can't build a better past. You can only build a better future. I've tried to do that over the last 40 years as I've gone on my literacy journey with the understanding that I can't teach, can't even get kids excited about what I haven't read. It's hard to recommend what you haven't read, what you haven't appreciated, what you haven't been challenged by. So in other words, you can't lead it if you don't read it. Say that aloud, please, educators. You can't lead it? Yeah, I could do that better. Do Dr. Anita Archer did that great. Don't you think she did that well in the morning? Okay. Raise your hand if you'd like to be her when you grow up. I know, right? For real. Okay. So say it with me. You can't lead it? If you don't read it, you don't read there you go, and you can't. Um, interestingly enough, even if you have read it, you may not be able to lead it. But you're certainly not going to be able to lead what you've never read. So we're here to grow. We're here to grow about the how of literacy. Many of you have gone through letters training. Many of you have gone through other trainings on the how of literacy. But many of you are less conversant on the why of literacy. It's not simply diversity in literacy. It's not simply uh, about different types of people. It's about history. It's about social studies. It's about science. It's about whatever can get kids reading. Because at the end of the day, once they're readers, we have them. Because once they're readers, they drive their vocabulary development, their fluency development, their knowledge development. They become stronger and stronger readers. What they choose to read is their business. That they choose to read is ours. Now, some of the why of literacy is about science and social studies, but some of it is about this thing that we call diversity in literacy. More than 30 years after I began, began my own diversity in literacy training, uh, my local school district, Kalamazoo Public Schools, raise your hand if you, uh, if you are from KPS. KPS in the house, there we go. <laughs> And raise your hand if you are a KPS alum. There you go. So about a decade ago, we began our diverse classroom libraries journey in my former district. And that was inspired by the personal professional journeys of Ms. Deborah Gant and Ms. Joan Tompkins, two elementary teachers at Arcadia Elementary. Ms. Tompkins has passed. Ms. Gant, I believe, is still with us. They had for years collected diverse literature and excited their kids in their classrooms with diverse literature. And we worked to take their classrooms district-wide. And now we're working to take districts statewide in this, in this effort. That's the idea that all children should see themselves and others in their literature. You don't always have to see yourself in your literature. Um, and you don't always have to see other people in in your literature, but you do have to see a mix because we're preparing young people for diverse environments. Some people have said, well, you know, my district is 99% uh, 
whatever. So that's beautiful, that's fine. But the world that children are going to enter as adults, our state, our country, our world, is diverse. And you talk with young people who go to Michigan State or U of M or, or, for, or any other university for that matter, you talk with them about their experiences and they talk about how comfortable they are or how comfortable they aren't with diversity when they get on campus. And that's a function of what they've experienced as little ones. So in 2017, educators, we had our first statewide diversity in literature conference. It was at Western Michigan University. KPS hosted. We had a number of statewide organizations involved. 2021, we put out our equity and literacy guidance document. Many of you have used that guidance document. And in the interim, from 2021 until today, we've had a number of conferences and webinars and se seminars. We've put out more guidance. We've put out calendars of great authors of color and their outstanding works. And we're here today. But this is just a piece of the journey, right? There's so much more to do. And we believe, about, we believe in teaching the full breadth, not only of literature, but also of history as well. Because one child may be interested in yucky, blucky fruitcakes, and another child may, may not be interested in, uh, in fiction, but may only be interested in nonfiction, and that's fine. Uh, but what's not fine is that they're not introduced to the full breadth of humanity in their, um, in their reading. So this is prelude, ladies and gentlemen, for our keynote speaker this afternoon. To our day, I am honored to introduce Ms. Ifa Baeza to tell us about her own literary journey and the importance of schools in that journey. Ms. Baeza is an award-winning theater artist, novelist, and educator whose acclaimed drama, The Ballad of Emmett Till, earned her the prestigious Edgar Award for Best Play in 2009. Ms. Baeza is the recipient of distinguished awards that include the Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference Fellowship, the Arna Bonton Centennial Writers Fellowship, two fellowships to the Tuck School Minority Business Executive Program, and the Backstage Garland Award for Best Playwriting. Ms. Baeza co-authored with her sister, Entozake Shange, the novel Some Sing, Some Cry, which chronicled 200 years of African-American music through seven generations of a family of extraordinary women. It is one of the few 560-page books that I have ever read twice. The most recent, a few months ago, over winter break in preparation for a conversation with Aoife, in which I felt like I had to raise my game. As a performer and lecturer, Ms. Baeza has appeared at the Getty Institute, the Chicago Historical Museum, the Mississippi Museum of Art, Brava Women's Center for the Arts, the McNay Art Museum in San Antonio, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., the Cosmic Theater in the Netherlands, which sounds like a place that is very high up on my list, and the Sorbonne in France. I had the amazing opportunity to see her Till trilogy, three plays about Emmett Till at the Mosaic Theater in Washington, D.C., one powerful weekend a year and a half ago. Ms. Baeza is a graduate of Harvard University with an MFA in theater from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was a four-year distinguished visiting scholar and artist in residence at Brown University, and in 2018 was named inaugural humanist in residence, say that five times quickly, at the National Endowment of the Humanities. Lastly, she is a current member of the Dramatist Guild of America as she comes up to share with you her own literary journey. Please give her a very, very warm Michigan welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello. So good, it's working. I can't tell from up here. Thank you, Michael, for that beautiful introduction. And uh, thank you, Jenna, Jen, and 
Raina and Missy and your entire creative team uh, for making this opportunity possible. It's an honor to stand here before you, an assembly of teachers, administrators, and educators, to lobby on behalf of the subjects I love, literature, literacy, and history. I hope to share a few childhood anecdotes that fueled my passion and shaped my vision and set my path as an activist, advocate, and artist, to explore the subjects of language and history, into how they intertwined in the making of my literary life, and how diverse the experience have been that inspired that, that journey. In writing this presentation and reflecting upon the history, I confess that I was surprised to discover how much anxiety, fear, and anger were at the root of my quest, and to conjecture how that may also be at the root of some hapless students' challenges today. So, you know, at the end of this cycle, and I hope to share with Michael some um, ideas that I've come up with over the years, rules of the road, so to speak, that have been useful to me and that may be helpful to you as well. Writing. Falling in love with writing is one of my earliest recollections. I can't tell you the story of my literary life without including a bit of my sister's. Anyone who has siblings can relate to the duality and symbiosis, the quest for individuation, the tangled intertwining of experience for sisters close in age. Such a relationship invariably generates myriad advent uh, adventures ranging from terrifying to magnificent. That is especially true if that sister would one day grow up to be the world-renowned writer Antezaki Shange, author of the now classic choreo poem, for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Zaki has influenced millions of writers and readers, myself included. But in my case, not in the ways you might think. You want to know about my sister? I could write a book. <laughs> well, we did. Some sing, some cry. But that was fiction. In no way more fantastical than real life. Kindergarten. My first day of school, I came home so proud of myself. My cousin Catherine had taught me how to write my name that summer. So when the teacher started that lesson, I told her, I already know how to do that. I rushed home across the street and bragged to my sister and demonstrated how I had written my firm straight letters on my fat lined paper with my big red pencil. Wanda Williams. But my sister, my pal, her black marble eyes sparkling with mischief, her perfectly sculpted eyebrows arched in two check marks with all the seven-year-old swag she could muster said, that's not writing. This is writing. And she took her thin yellow pencil and began to etch her name across the paper. Paulette Linda Williams. <laughs> Looping curls that made me dizzy just to look at them. Swells that lifted you like the ocean. Letters that danced across the page. My own name now looked like a bunch of shorn, spindly trees huddled together in the winter, like sticks, when hers looked like waves, glistening swirls across a white sapphire sea. Writing, I had to learn how to do that. It was rapturous. I was enchanted, enthralled by the choreography of her hand, the dance. It was the dance that seduced me that day, the picture that I fell in love with. It was the visual delight that inspired me, that rush of senses and sensations. I actually remember being titillated by the sound of the pencil gliding across the page, the sensual tactile sonic timbre of the lead pencil on the paper was like brush strokes on the cymbal. For many years, I believed that the euphoric experience of that afternoon had nothing to do with the literal, literary word, writing. How wrong I was. 
Only in preparing this presentation did I realize that the experience had everything to do with the literature and language. The power of language to convey through hearing, seeing, and feeling. The sudden understanding of multiple meanings. The sound, the image, the movement, the sheer making of it was magic. It was poetry representing power and infinite possibility. In one word, writing. Reading. In 1956, my family moved from central New Jersey to St. Louis so my father could continue his medical studies specializing in surgery. The gateway to the West, my mother declared as she sang wagon wheels out the window of her ancient Cadillac. Being a Northeastern child, I literally thought we were going to see cowboys and Indians. I've written about those years in a play called Wanderland. My world as strange as Alice's Wonderland ever was. We moved to a private street written up in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as an experiment in integration. Our family was supposed to be photographed for the spread, but when the reporter saw how white my mother looked, they just took a picture of the house instead. <laughs> While our street was unusual at the time for its racial mixture of families, outside the stone gates of Windermere Place, just across the boulevard, was an all-black universe teeming with black baby boomer blue-collar children. Like them, entering the first grade, I attended the overcrowded, magnificent Clark Elementary School, three stories bulging at the seams from K to eight. The few white children were extremely poor, with visibly ill-fitted and worn clothing, various disabilities, and a handful were from an all-white orphanage. I learned sign language from Gloria Grossman, whose parents were both deaf, and only years later understood the significance of the numbers on their arms. But this small token of diversity evaporated quickly due to what I learned was white flight. It was like the Westerns on TV, where the settlers had just disappeared, leaving the food still warm on the table. For all intents and purposes, the natives had moved in and Clark School was black. Still, we all drew our faces with orange crayon. You see, in that day, none of the teaching material contained an image of a black child. We weren't on television either, so it was a wholly other world from this one. My awareness of this Exclusion was ignited by default. We were learning how to read from a book about Dick and Jane and their dog Spot. I was not impressed. <laughs> it wasn't their pinky whiteness, their Dove Beauty Bar whiteness. They were just boring. <laughs> and they made the activity of reading boring too. See Spot run, why? <laughs> then one day, Mrs. Tennis Cutter, a tall, angular, but always pleasant woman brought in a new book, The Cat in the Hat. I tell you, that book changed my life. It was funny, fanciful, and it rhymed. It was sassy and smart and boldly irreverent. Here was a character who did what he liked, even if he wasn't supposed to. And though none of the characters looked like me, they didn't look like Dick and Jane either. <laughs> it was such a joy to hear and see a text that played so artfully with language, giving me the authority to do that as well. Dr. Seuss sealed my love of humor, fantasy, and cartooning as a way of breaking out of our binary humanness. Only years later did I discover that the cat in the hat was an early arts and education experiment. The author, Theodore Seuss Geisel, after years of marginal success as an experimental writer, graphics artist, and filmmaker, palling around with the likes of James Joyce and Frank Capra, Capra, was approached by his editor to use his graphics in a children's book. Apparently, the editor, taking a page out of yesterday's news, was distressed that American children were lagging behind their counterparts in Soviet Russia and Europe. So he sent Geisel a vocabulary list of words that elementary school children were supposed to know. And ta-da, an American classic was born, and Geisel found his niche as Dr. Seuss, a franchise now with over 60 books 
selling over 600 million copies in over 20 languages with films, bedsheets, and merchandise galore. Seuss's love of language and children and humanity was self-evident, even to me, a six-year-old. And that passion was so infectious that it became one of the main elements of style in my work for young audiences. I applied a variation of this formula to my musical Kid Zero. Dr. Seuss, uh, what he did with vocabulary, I attempted to tackle with the world of mathematics, our weapon of choice, words. Tired of the repeated adage of girls and children of color underperforming in math and science and by inference being less able, I created the city, city of New Metropolis where all are welcome from place value to the Big Bang. The work by its nature is diverse, for none of the characters are human. <laughs> Our protagonist, Kid Zero, has a problem. The youngest member of the Digit family, she thinks she has no place and no value. And her siblings, one, three, four, five, and the terrible twos, have convinced her of this. Thus, she believes she's also the cause of tension between her parents, Rulius, a 12-inch who's been laid off because he's not metric, and Pencilla, a number two pencil, uh, pencil who is trying desperately to land a permanent job. Here is a bit of the opening morning when Pencilla is headed for yet another interview and disaster. As she checks herself in the mirror, the kids line up for the bathroom. Mother's moving up in the world. All the future is numbers. Pencilla measure, you are on your way. I got the bathroom first. No way, say. You snooze, you lose, twos. Mom, hey, this is your mother's big break. Everybody better be awake and ready like yesterday. I've been waiting a long time for this. Got my power suit, my new high heels to boot. How does mother look? <laughs> Pretty sharp, huh? Oh, oh, time to book. Get breakfast, here your lunches. Get a move on and listen. You have to look out for each other. What do we say? No size or shape shaming in this place. No size or shape shaming in this space. Correct. Check, check, check. That's what I expect. Number one, Ma, get a grip. I don't need any lip from you. I cannot be bothered with this. Where is your father? Must I run this house by myself? How do I look? I think you should lose the eraser. I like this eraser. I bought this eraser to go with a power suit. It makes you look like you don't have confidence. Nonsense! That's ridiculous. Does this eraser look worn down and dirty? Do you see this? Do you see this? It's totally clean. That means I don't make mistakes. <laughs> so here's an example of how, the, how elastic the word diversity can be and how versatile it, its use. Okay. <laughs> Punctuation. Uh, it could mean blending language and mathematics, language and science, language arts and visual art, language arts and music, as Zaki and I did in our novel, language and everything. There are ways to enliven all subjects through its playful and creative use. When we independently produced Kid Zero in Chicago for 15,000 public school children, 100% of the teachers surveyed reported that Kid Zero gave their students a better attitude toward math. And 97% reported it gave them new tools for understanding math. On the way home to Gary, Indiana, a fourth grade teacher reported that her students had a 45 minute conversation about the difference between zero and infinity. Now that's some brain synapses forming. Intelligence. Speaking of the fourth grade, that was another pivotal year for me. I advanced from my basement classroom where the floor heated up your shoes to the second floor with huge bay windows and Mrs. Johnson. A lot of people don't like my disposition. Well, I am here to tell you I do not care. <laughs> you are not here to like me. You are here to learn what you are supposed to know in the fourth grade. So if you don't like me, the best thing you can do is to be a good student and get promoted out of here. And how do we do that? When I say you have homework, you had better do it. And when I say pay attention, you had better fix your eyes on me. And when I say no talking, 
I had better hear the wind whistling through that window pane. I loved her. She was so beautiful, big red lips, hair the color of a copper penny and skin to match, come hell or high water, even if we didn't have enough desks for the 44 of us. And if the books were falling apart, she was going to teach us and I was ready to learn because I was on a very important secret mission. Welcome to Wonderland, the dossier. Fearing a reprise from Little Rock, the city of St. Louis has come up with an ingenious solution, a modern Missouri compromise. We have created a gifted program, and by selecting exceptional Negro students to be in it, we can lead the rest of the Negroes exactly where they are. Dewey was a special school, a gifted school, two trolley cars and a bus ride away, attracting only the best, and my sister, was the only one from Clark who had gotten in. It was very important that I find out how she did that. She was already getting special treatment. She got to eat breakfast first and use the bathroom first. She got a record player for her birthday. She got lunch money, and she and mom would go off and talk about secret stuff, talking about periods for 20 minutes. I mean, how long does it take to figure out the end of a sentence? <laughs> and she's supposed to be gifted. <laughs> it all happened with that Sputnik stuff. Ever since the Russians went up in space, everybody's been acting strange. Granted, my sister has always been strange. How many people do you know who eat the margins of the New York Times? Not any paper, mind you, just the Sunday Times from New York, and not the print, just the margins. If she rationed it out, it would last the whole week. But now she was acting downright peculiar. Do I know you? Of course you know me. I'm your sister, Wanda Williams, remember? I have a sister? Very funny. Hey, wait, yes, wait. I just want to know what your school is like. Go away and do not touch my things. Ooh, look, developing nations. I was missing something critical information, and I was not above devious means to get it. I had to know what was on that test. Ow! Let go! Are you going to tell me or not? Not! Come on, what's on that test? What do I need to know? Tell! No! What do I need? A new brain. Ask Santa to give you one for Christmas along with an another brain damage child. <gasps> oh no, you don't, you don't say anything about Lydia. She's recovering from surgery. Tell now or I'll pull out all your hair and you see how it feels. Ow! Let go. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you what you need to know. Everything there is to know in the world. Nobody knows everything there is to know in the world. That's why nobody got into Dewey School but me. <laughs> you don't even know everything there is to know in the world. You got a P in arithmetic. I was lucky. They didn't ask me any arithmetic. You don't know what they're going to ask you. It's just like the college bowl. They might ask you all arithmetic. They might ask you the theory of relativity. You know what? They're, you don't know what they're going to ask, so you don't know what you have to know. So the only way to pass it is to know everything. Everything, everything, everything. Ha! Huh. Think about that, smarty pants. Intelligence. Where are you going to find it, huh? Everything there is to know in the world. I knew she wasn't telling the truth, but just in case, that year, I read the entire world book encyclopedia from A to Z. I must have worn Mrs. Johnson out. Mrs. Johnson, guess what? Did you know, did you know, did you know about Mahatma Gandhi and Diogenes and Stephen Foster and Gertrude Stein? Do you know, do you know, do you know about electromagnetism and aardvarks and rock formations and the Wright brothers and the secret life of bees and cumulus clouds and Radcliffe College? Hmm, I think I'll go there. And Amelia Earhart. Ooh. That didn't end well. A premonition? When I was called to take that doggone test that spring, it was the standard Stanford Binet IQ test. Since the woman was stringing beads, I started looking out the window waiting for her to ask me a question. 
So when she asked me to string the beads the way she had just done, a small atomic bomb went off in my head as it dawned on me that my sister, my pal, that Jezebel had tricked me again. I was still fuming about that when the woman held up an image and asked me, what's wrong with this picture? In the foreground was a pilgrim holding a musket that was aimed at an Indian far in the distance, while directly behind him was another Indian holding a tomahawk squarely over his pilgrim's head. Not a great time to have an epiphany. My little nine-year-old brain exploded into multiple universes of understanding. A, there is nothing wrong with that picture if you were an Indian. B, if you were Mahatma Gandhi, the path of violence is always wrong. C, if I wanted to pass the test, I should say that the pilgrim is aiming at the target in the distance when he is in danger of being attacked from behind. D, all three of those answers were true. And E, any one answer I chose would betray the others. So many pieces broke apart and fell into place in that instant. Not simply my comprehension of long-standing dynamics of race and power, but also the audacity that my intelligence would be assessed through such an impaired and biased instrument, cowboys and Indians indeed. In writing Wanderland, I wanted to create a literary and theater work that dramatized child anger and anxiety about, uh, anxiety about testing. And through the play itself, just like Kid Zero, to give kids who look like me a heads up. Through the experience of my semi-fictionalized child self, I hope audiences receive acknowledgement that their feelings about unfairness and imbalance may just be valid. And to dispel some of their anxiety through the comedy of that fateful year and what I felt to be, at the time, the worst days of my life. Every time you see in the paper an article about a black school failing, test scores below white and Asian children, about entire neighborhood school systems not making the grade, children read this, internalize this as an indictment of their intelligence, and their punishment far too often feels like serving time, drilling via an intractably rigid process that constricts the very mental muscles it's intending to exercise, where they are taught rote learning and not critical thinking, robotic response and not creative initiative, where people believe knowledge can be installed and not instilled. To every passionate, creative, loving teacher out there who's already inventing ways to enliven your classroom, and I've talked to some of you today, and some of the things you're doing are quite wonderful, I thank you. In the fourth grade, that was Mrs. Johnson. When she informed my mother that I had passed the test, she told her, you need to pay your child more attention. If the child is acting out hyperactive, absent often, distracted or disaffected, I bet Mrs. Johnson would advise the very same thing. History and current events. Fifth grade, I was off to Dewey School myself. Psyche had told me about the TV in class and learning French, and I had seen the new books and gadgets, like the colorful abacus that each student received. What she didn't tell me was that except for the two of us and four other black children, the whole school was white. The only difference between us and Little Rock, as far as I could tell, was that we had no police escort. I was beginning to understand the disparities between the outside world and the world within, the contrasting experience of home and school, and in particular, how one absorbs the greater world. I was also made acutely aware of how teacher bias can influence behavior. At home, I was in love with Patrice Lumumba, prime minister of the newly formed Democratic Republic of the Congo. I liked it mostly because he looked like my dad before he combed his hair, and because I delighted in saying his musical name, I fell in love with Patrice Lumumba. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> At school, my teacher's name was Mrs. Mangan, and her animal totem was somewhere between a chicken and a blue-eyed bald eagle. She and I got off to a rocky start. The day she introduced us to the idea of current events, 
in preparation for our first assignment, she asked the class why, for instance, Catholicism was suddenly in the news so much. My hand shot up and I answered confidently, because John Kennedy is running for president and he's Catholic. It seemed to me that rage washed over her face. That's not the answer. That is not the right answer. Who knows the right answer? Billy Wilcox shyly raised his hand and responded, because Cardinal Cook is coming to St. Louis? Yes, yes, that's right, Billy, that's right. Yes, she beamed. I was totally confused. I was not Catholic, so I didn't even know what a cardinal was besides a bird. And Billy was right, perhaps, because the cardinal, as I saw in the paper she held up, was coming to visit. But I didn't understand why I was made to feel such embarrassment and why my answer had merited that public scolding and shaming. And even though I thought my answer was as correct as Billy's, I now doubted myself. I realized much later, as I tried to understand her character while writing The Pacer, that possibly Mrs. Mangan's own sensitivity as an Irish Catholic had caused her to take that tone. This, however, would not be the last time she addressed me in that manner. Later in the school year, when she asked the class what were the causes of the Civil War, ever intrepid, I raised my hand and said, without, I might add, any particular awareness of my race at the moment, slavery. That look came upon her again, something akin to impatience, disgust, frustration, and fury folded her entire chin into her neck. No, that is not the right answer. Who knows the right answer? Billy Wilcox once again responded, states rights. Being twice wounded, I did not raise my hand to add the retort bouncing around in my brain. That brief exchange surely contributed to my subsequent body of plays on American abolition and the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century, including string theory on the Amistad slave ship, the rescue of John Price on a fa famous Ohio fugitive slave rescue, and One Small Alice, which I'm working on now. All written to answer in an unequivocal, unambiguous fashion what I failed to say that day. States rights to do what? Alas, our tussle was not yet done. For my current event assignment, I chose to follow the year, uh, that year, the fall of the Belgian Congo. <laughs> as biased as news sources were at the time, and as complex the transfer of power from colonial rule to African independence, and with all of the international intrigue related to the emergence of the Republic of the Congo from decades of Belgian oppression, exploitation, and terror. I didn't understand half of what I was reading, but I did know I was seeing a black man speaking up without fear and without hesitation on behalf of his people and the independence of his nation. I followed the headlines and news diligently in the papers and on television. It was such a refreshing feast compared to the steady diet of King Kong Tarzan and the anonymous yelping half-dressed gibbering Los Angeles extras passing as African natives in the movies. Patrice the movie Lumumba was a modern African rattling the world with his words. And then he was captured. And on the nightly news was a clip of him on his knees on an airport tarmac where another African, a soldier, held a small piece of paper and shoved it in his mouth. I watched in horror as a fellow countryman forced him to eat his own words. I did not turn in my current events assignment the next day. And the fifth grade year is the only one where my grades were mediocre. I had shut down for it seemed what was happening in the Belgian Congo was happening to me. Strangely, my turnaround that year was orchestrated by the very same Mrs. Mangan. She held me after class and shaking her head with dismay said, I don't understand you, Wanda. You have one of the highest IQs in this class. Other than my beautiful 3D relief map of the country of Colombia, that was the first affirmation that woman gave me all year. And paltry as it was, 
That sentence was enough to confirm that I was not stupid, and just as she couldn't understand why I was not doing well, she could not understand how her actions were contributing to my difficulties. For students today, it's especially important to be able to access and critically interpret news sources, to read between the lines, to check reliability, to cross-reference, and to read with more acuity. And that goes for reading history, current events, images, and people. We should not allow statements in the public sphere that we know to be untrue go unaddressed. For instance, it was suggested recently that one of the benefits of slavery was the skills that people learned. Skills, by their nature, must be taught and learned. That goes for everybody. The condition of bondage contributes to those acts in no way whatsoever. And under that draconian system known as slavery, the one skill that was denied and punishable, punishable by law was reading. Why is that? Letters. Seventh to ninth grade was a blur of braces and boys, and yet another variation of segregated life. The family had moved back to New, uh, New Jersey suburbs, and my siblings and I were among a handful of middle-class black children who were admitted to the upper tracks of Lawrence Junior High. All of the other black children were in Mr. Floyd's class. Mr. Floyd was also black, and his class was what you call special ed. As far as I can remember, there were perhaps a couple of white children assigned to him, but they were both kind of swarthy. So the visual deduction was that black children were less intelligent by nature, by race, by color, and that my sister, brother, and I were somehow the exceptions. Case in point, when my father, who was a brown-skinned man, came to the parent-teacher night, because he was brown-skinned, my eighth-grade English teacher, Mrs. Yard, suggested that he was in the wrong classroom. He conveyed the anecdote to us later, with his usual wry humor, as he so often did, to shield us. Always have a sense of humor was his main maxim in life, but he never went again. The summer before eighth grade, I met a boy named Ricky Butler at a convention of black middle-class youth called Jack and Jill, and he wrote me a letter. I was shocked and thrilled at the same time. I was just writing him back when I heard he had been killed in a car crash. That same summer, I saw a picture of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old youth like myself and Ricky, who had been brutally murdered a decade before. Ricky and Emmett Till in life looked very much alike, so the two conflated in my mind, and along with the memory of ostracism and containment of black students and the pejorative relegation of black minds and bodies to the bottom, these experiences lingered in my heart. The mixture of emotions manifest decades later in the Till Trilogy, my trio of plays chronicling the saga of civil rights icon Emmett Till. The first play, The Ballad of Emmett Till, is my love song to black youth. It's also my way of representing black adolescents, honoring their vulnerability and pain too often experienced, and paying homage to their agency and the role youth have played in our struggle for liberation. It was a supreme delight in my research to come across another letter, one from Emmett Till himself, one that he had written the summer before he was to enter the ninth grade to a girl named Heloise Woods, a letter she had saved for 50 years from the Ballad of Emmett Till. Okay, okay, Ma. I promise, I won't look at them. Look, my eyes are closed. Da don't look. My mama da don't know. I'm from Chicago. Girl watching in the summer. <laughs> Wear a brother out. You die and go to heaven every day. Oh, a national pastime. The girls bloom like flowers in the summertime, man. You got tulips, roses, daffodils, bluebells, buttercups, Venus flytraps. I step out. Hair press pat, pant line pat, a ripple and a sheen with a dip that's mean. I met this girl last May. 
of, 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 of all places, Argo. Church went up to a carnival. Heloise, Heloise Woods, hello, ho, 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 Heloise. Okay, okay, okay. I bought a ticket at the carnival to ride on the thing. We were standing in line, getting on two by two. Noah's Ark. I'm moving right along beside her, counting to make sure we, 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 we end up together in the same car. And Curtis, baby, I mean Curtis, jumped the line. I, I, I pushed past him and just make it pa-pow. And I'm sitting right next to her, our own car, an aerial carriage, chains rattle the seat, then, 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 it started up. Up, up, up we went. Up, up, up we going. She draws close, one hand round my, round my girl, and you're praying, yes, yes, yes. And it stops at the very top. Stars out, carnival lights below, the car swinging in the breeze. Woo-wee, just her and me. And mama want to go on a road trip. I tell you, I had to write the gal a letter. Dear Heloise, I am not coming out in Argo next Saturday because my mama wants me to go to Detroit. I liked it when I was out there. And we went up out there in that carnival. Cutest little thing. Beautiful brown skin, like, 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 like a, 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 a piece of milk chocolate. Long, pretty hair. Met a little girl named Heloise wrote her letter to be my squeeze. Sorry, baby, I can't come to town, but I sure want to see you, girl, next time I'm around. Remember M, remember E, put them both together and remember me. E M M and E T T, hey, hey, pretty baby, remember me. Emmett Lewis Till from Chicago, but you can call me. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Yeah, wanna know the truth? We finished the ride. I stood up there. All I could say was, bye. <laughs> now how, 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 not, 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 not cool could you be? Haven't heard back from her yet. Only been three months, but I will. Put two carnival tickets in the envelope. Labor Day weekend, church picnic, you know a cat's got nine lives. Ancient history. Tenth grade was ancient history. I attended Trenton High School in the advanced track called Humanities. My teacher was Miss Ferry, who lived with an Irish Miss Ferry, who had been my teacher in the eighth grade. That was information I attempted to process for a very long time. Miss Ferry, F-E-R-R-I, was another one of my wonderful teachers. That year, I read the Iliad and the Odyssey, the great Greek dramatists, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the Epic of Ashoka and Gilgamesh. Today, I might add the Chinese novel, Dream of a Red Lantern, and the Malian Epic, Oski, uh, epic of Askia Muhammad, and perhaps the Islamic classic, Tazia. I was privileged to add to my body of work, Tazia Between Two Rivers, as far as I know, the only English translation of the 7th century Persian epic text. It is also the only classic drama in Islam. In, the sto in story, it suggests the origin of the tensions between Shia and Sunni within Islam. In structure, it is a unique window into the ancient and medieval classical drama and how it is presented as the work is still performed all over the world today. In character, it shows through the words and actions of Zainab the power and authority that the women of Islam once possessed and suggest by inference what they may yet achieve. At the end of the drama, Zainab has lost almost every member of her family. Now in captivity, she speaks thus. I have no heart for this anymore. It's women who bear the toll of war. My mother, where are you? Why, Karbala, I ask you, if this is the toll of war, what is there left to give? What more? Has this battle of brother upon brother no end but this endless slaughter? My clothes are rent, hope spent, 
My children die before me, and I grow weary. My tongue tastes of dust. What will become of us? I am blind to the end of this story. Light of my light, I wait upon your glory. Once our women wept like the sound of birds. Our sorrow filled the sky and across the plains could be heard, oh, how I miss the sound of birds. In the face of such violence, their mute songs become a piercing silence. Tis an endless quiet. Oh, I would die yet. I live. So, in closing, summer camp. My final lesson in literature and history I'd like to share with you today involved my summer job after graduation. My father, who was on the state commission examining New Jersey farm labor practices, got me a job, job at a teacher's aid, as a teacher's aide at a migrant camp school in Cranberry, New Jersey. Even though we lived beside a farm, I had not realized the extent of agricultural business in the Garden State or the significance of migrant labor and its productivity. These families had been traveling the same route year after year in a wide loop throughout the eastern United States, harvesting oranges, grapefruit, cotton, tobacco, corn, and yes, cranberries. And because of the migratory pattern, the children of these families only attended school in the cracks of time, from region to region, in makeshift trailers and schoolhouses, abandoned by their normal attendees who were off on summer vacation. The experience was unlike any I had ever known before or since. The depth of poverty was visibly evident in the huge infected scabs on many of the children's lower legs. The school nurse said they were mosquito bites that got infected because the children scratched them too much. But my dad, who grew up on a farm, informed me that they were rat bites. The hair of some of the children was tinged red like the pictures we would later see of Biafran children during the famine of war. Robert's legs were so bold, were bold as a horseshoe from rickets, and there was so little calcium in his body that it could not produce his primary teeth. With his big, beautiful eyes bulging from thyroid deficiency and his toothless smile, he had the countenance and lethargy of an old man. The kids put ice cream in their pockets to save it for later. And when we took them to the petting zoo, they tried to sneak off with a duckling to cook it for dinner. <laughs> I was instructed to help prepare them for a standardized test to determine their grade level. One question asked about shining shoes when several of the children had none. I had ideas even then about creative lesson planning, and I got the teacher to allow me one day where I could do my own, my first foray into self-portraiture. I brought in a bunch of tiny mirrors and all kinds of collage material, and then encouraged each child to pick among the beads and glitter, the beans and nuts, felt and buttons and string, to create their own image, to let others see how they saw themselves. Tommy didn't talk much because he had a lisp. He took a Brazil nut and glued it to the corner of his paper. I said, Tommy, is that all you're gonna do? Where's the rest? You've got nothing on your paper but a nut. He lolled his eyes at me and said, that's what I'm is, miss, nothing. All that knowledge that I had acquired, all that wisdom I thought I possessed, all that language I had been trying to master, all that intelligence I presumed I had, all that arrogance crumbled in my heart. For here was a history standing before me here was that dusty trail of that terrible journey that began with our enslavement hundreds of years before. Here was that history standing before me as a living presence, its legacy compacted into the body of a seven-year-old boy. And here was a genius poet. No matter how many books I read, how many microaggressions I personally endured in my brief 18 years, this was a story I had not heard, 
a reality I had never imagined. Through those remarkable children that summer, I realized how much more I had to learn, and I determined that I would use the art of language to chronicle those hidden narratives, to champion those brilliant minds, to share with the world what I had discovered, the beautiful humanity of my people, the epic, heroic, and noble story of our journey in this new world. And I've been on that quest ever since. That day I was stunned into silence. If I could go back in time though, what would I say? That's very interesting, Tommy. It moves me, the picture you have made. It has made me think a great deal. You have created not only a portrait, but a poem. Do you know what that is? You have made a truly important statement that says so many things with such a small item. It's a piece of modern art. But you know, some modern artists do pictures of themselves all the time so they can see and show who they are from one moment to the next. You've got Frida Kahlo and Jean-Michel Basquiat and uh, Vincent Van Gogh and Salvador Dali. He really was a nut. And Frederick Douglass, the greatest black man in the 19th century and perhaps one of the most important men in the history of our nation. He had more pictures of himself than anybody else in the world. Let me show you some. And let's hang this one up. You've made. Shall we? What do you say we do another? Another one. You and I, together. Let's look in that mirror and see what we see. I don't know how you guys do it. How to make a safe place where you have active shooter drills. How to grade a student who may be suffering from lead poisoning. How a child may be distracted by what she sees happening halfway across the globe. You never know what might be the moment. You never know what might be the spark when you may change a child's life or that she may change yours. The world is vast and full of wonders. And whether you're looking in the mirror or through a window or across a threshold or a sliding door, you are their guides and the ones with whom we entrust our future. Let's look in the mirror and see what we see. Shall we? Sometimes that's all a child needs. That's all a child wants. I see you. Yo te veo a ti. Je te vois. Araki. Wo kanjiani. We benamax. Ya bachitebe. I see you. I see you, and I thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Aoife Baeza, thank you for sharing your time, your talent, inspirational literary genius, and humanity with us. The 2024 MDE Diversity and Literature Conference has been filled with greatness all day. Thank you for exponentially adding to its place value. And so with that, as they say, it's a wrap. We have um, a new shipment of Some Sing, Some Cry you can find out at the Socialite Society bookstore. We have our afternoon EndNote um, sketch codes up here on the screen, along with our opening keynote and one of Dr. Anita Archer's breakout sessions if you did not get that earlier. So thank you all for coming today. We wish you all very safe travels on your way and go be great for students. <laughs>